didn't have the time to be here all day. I really would have liked to hear all the presentations, especially also to get to know you a little bit, to know what you've been talking about. Um, as, um, as you just heard, I come from the Danish Agency for Digitization. We're part of the Ministry of Finance. And you might think that this might be an unusual venue for somebody from the Ministry of Finance to speak. Yes, it is. It is quite unusual. Not so much for me, but f it would be for most of, of my colleagues. But I'm very pleased to be here. And just to start off, now I'm going to talk more about data than, than getting data, or at least getting data through APIs, but I'll get back to that. I'll just like to start with this. This is actually a symbol of, of ecosystems, because as I gathered from the presentations I've heard, you are very much thinking in terms of enabling some kind of ecosystem to, to get data, to, to provide data. And uh, whether it's through an API or not, doesn't really matter. And this is actually a tiny uh, ecosystem which sits in my home. I don't know if you can see it, but there are two or three little shrimps inside it. And on that little twig, there are a number of different types of algae growing. Uh, and as long as this gets some, some amount of daylight, it's actually a kind of self-sustaining little ecosystem that can run for years and years. And that is the kind of inspiration I try to bring to the public sector. And it's also the kind of, of inspiration I try to bring to people like you, that I would very much like to, to come to the public sector and ask for data. The thing is, I think the reason, the main reason why the public sector is even interested in, in talking about opening up its data is that we're really standing on a burning platform. We have a problem. And I think that goes for most societies. Um, demographics means that we get more and more elderly people that we need to care for. Um, we have fewer people who actually um, make money and make business um, to, to actually give us tax money to do this. We have um, decreasing productivity and, uh, well, we got the financial crisis, so we really have a problem. Um, and it's not like we thought, okay, we have a burning platform, now we want to open up our data. Of course, it's not that simple. I'm just trying to tell you this to say that this is really on a lot of civil servants' minds. We do realize that we have a problem. And I'm trying to suggest to you ways in which you can actually exploit this situation to get hold of public sector data. First of all, I would just like to, um, to share this um, analogy with you. Um, data is a bit like coffee. And I think it's really important when you talk to people, whether they're in the public sector or in, in another place, that you realize that people have different ideas about data. For some, data is actually like coffee beans. They're, in, they're interested in the, the tiny weeny details of, of data, whereas to others it's like, yeah, well, I don't like to eat coffee beans. What can I use them for? Others would be more interested in information. This is like the, the ground up coffee, the, the kind of stuff that you realize, I can use this for something. Whereas most of us would be really interested in this bit, the cup of coffee, the actual knowledge, the thing that you can, you can get out of using data. Then some people are clever enough to, uh, to make a coffee shop or a cafe in which you, you put the coffee into a context. This is when you start to get real value out of it. And in the end, you have Starbucks that sells all sorts of merchandise related to coffee. I'm sure you can even buy a scarf or a pair of gloves from Starbucks. That is a really clever business model. And you just need to realize when you talk to people, not least in the public sector, it may be that the people you talk to, they don't really care about data itself or the coffee beans, but they do understand once you start talking about knowledge or even the wisdom or, th or the clever uh, business model at the end. So you need to determine what kind of people am I talking to? What kind of, of story should I tell them? Another way to look at it is to say what is in fact data? We talk about data a lot and often we talk about government data. Um, usually I say public sector data because otherwise you might have that idea when I say government, do I mean el elected government or do I mean all of the public sector? And I do mean all of the public sector. Um, actually, the area which is most in focus uh, when it comes to the kind of work I do is, um, is the kind that's highlighted in, in bluish-green, PSI, or public sector information. And that is because that is the kind of, of data and information that we have in public sector agencies that we can actually give away for people like you and others to use. Um, 
PSI is, as far as I know, the definition that has and a definition that has been coined by the European Commission. Um, in any case, there's legislation that actually tries to promote the reuse of public sector information in all European countries. And, and most people don't know that. And most people don't really use that legislation for anything. And I'm not trying to tell you that you, you can actually walk up to some public agency with this particular law in your hand and say, I have the right to get your data. But this is actually quite important. Um, a subset of, of this uh, public sector information would be uh, the basic data. Public sector information covers almost anything. It can be met data about the weather, it can be uh, data about um, different types of schools, or it can be uh, environmental data. It can be about almost anything, and it's pretty much regardless of format and medium. The basic data is the sort of the core data that we use in the public sector, and I think that would be the kind of data that would be most interested interesting for businesses. Things like um, digital maps, uh, basic company uh, registration information, um, official addresses. For example, in, in Britain they have a problem that the, the official uh, postcodes are not just something that you can use uh, for free, it's actually a Royal Mail's property. Whereas in Denmark, postcodes and addresses are actually free and you can use the official postcodes and addresses as you want. I'll get back to the basic data because this type of data used to be sold in Denmark. You used to be able to buy it at a very high price, which was really a very huge barrier for most uh, companies. Most companies in Denmark are quite small, so they really didn't have the money to, uh, to pay for this data. So it would only be the very big players in the market that had access to this kind of data, which was really a problem because you don't really get much innovation that way. But that has changed recently, and we are already seeing some interesting results from that. Another category of data is personal data. And when I talk about opening up public sector data, I'm not talking about personal data. Back when we started talking about opening up public sector data, I had to say this, I'm not talking about personal data, right up like that. Because people would actually ask me, before I'd even finished the sentence, we want to open up public sector data, they would go, what about the, per what, what about the personal data? That's not the problem anymore. The interesting thing is, now people are actually starting to say to me, well, how about personal data? Can't that be used for something? And I'm really surprised, and I think it's because we're getting used to the idea that perhaps it can be used to s for certain things uh, and to a certain extent if, if we have some security rules around it. But actually, when I talk about public sector information, and most of what I do has nothing to do with personal data. Then there's big data. Um, I'm not even sure what big data is anymore. I find that most people, when they want to say, do something cool with data, they have a tendency to say big data. And it really pisses me off, because what are we going to do when we really mean big data, as in so big that it's too hard to handle the usual ways? So I was thinking maybe I wanted to bring a slide that I've seen in other people's uh, presentations, which is basically um, Samuel L. Jackson from uh, Pulp Fiction standing there, pointing an automatic gun directly at the audience, and somebody clever put the words, say big data one more time, dot, 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 on it. But I thought, as this is not really a big data conference, you're not the right audience to do it on. But I'm going to do it one day, definitely. It's not that I don't believe that big data can be important. It's just that I think at the moment big data is just about uh, hitting the top of the Gardner hype cycle, and I think that's really dangerous because people just fall in love with it, and they don't even know what, they, what it is. I mean, I, I know that a lot of my colleagues fall in love with it. They want to do something in terms of making Denmark a big data country, and they don't know any more than that which is really a problem because then they channel so much energy into doing something and they don't know what it is. So it's not that I've got anything <laughs> against big data, it's just that I've got something against wanting to do something very badly and you don't even know what it is or why you want to do it. <coughs> so, we have launched an open data innovation strategy in 2009, the beginning of 2009. Actually, I don't know how many of you speak Danish. It also has a name in, in Danish. It is Offenly Data Ispil. And you'll see that actually the uh, acronym will be the same, O-D-I-S, very clever. Actually, I prefer this name because this is what it's all about. It's about creating more innovation. 
And this is just a um, timeline of, of what we've done. And I'm only going to point out a few things because I don't have much time. The thing is, when we launched the initiative, it was a kind of grassroots initiative. Um, it was at a time when, actually, the Minister of Finance really didn't believe in the potentials of opening up data, in using data as a kind of digital raw material. So we had to sort of launch the initiative below the radar of the Ministry of Finance. And when I say that, you might wonder, well, didn't you say she came from the Ministry of Finance? Yes, I did, but not back then. I worked in a different agency back then. But then, actually, in 2011, something really important happened. It seems that there was a realization that this open data thing is not just a sort of hippie thing, be very altruistic, give your data away and great things might happen. Even the Ministry of Finance started to realize that there might actually be something to it. And at the same time, my agency was merged with another agency and I ended up in the Ministry of Finance. And I took this agenda with me. And now it's sort of welcome. Um, I think another thing I want to point out is that in 2012, based on the fact that um, open data was actually entered into the joint government strategy for digitization, um, which covers all levels of government, its central government, regional government and the municipalities, on the basis of that, an agreement was made that these expensive basic data were to be opened up and um, be reusable free of charge. And that actually happened um, a little over a year ago, on 1st of January 2013. They became totally free of charge, and we're already seeing some e effects of that. Um, another thing I'll just point out is that recently the um, EU directive on uh, making public sector information available was revised, and that means that as we speak here in Denmark, we're actually also changing the Danish legislation on this and the change in legislation is not probably going to help you much in getting hold of data in itself, but I think it provides a really great opportunity to um, highlight the importance of open data and to put it on the agenda. And I really encourage you to take this opportunity to um, actually put it to the attention of the Danish public sector, to each and every public sector agency, that there is legislation that actually um, tries to promote this. Um, because I think that there is a certain respect when you say, well, actually, we have a law that says that this would be a good idea to do. What we do in the uh, open data innovation strategy is, is not so much that we go out and open up data because we just don't have the resources to do it. And that's also why I'm, uh, I'm appealing to you. I would very much like you to, to create this great buzz, this great conversation about the importance of sharing data, the importance of the public sector opening up, and then try to use the kind of tools that we make available. We have um, created a data catalog. It's not very good, it's very old, and it's certainly not up to date. And that is a great problem because um, developers generally say, well, we would very much like to, to actually get data from this data catalog, but we're not even sure that when we see an entry and a description of the data, we're not even sure that the data is there. And they're absolutely right. At the same time, the public sector agencies tell me, well, perhaps we would like to register our available data sets in the catalog, but it's not really very good, and it's not in our impression that it's really being used, so we don't really want to take the time to do it. So you see, we have a bit of a catch-22 situation, and I think the only reason or the only way we can actually push this forward is for somebody to start using it and to insist that this is a good idea and we have to make it better. The thing is, I can't do that alone, even if I want to. We have also tried to publish some guidelines for, for the public sector. How can we actually make data available? There's a tech um, guide and a legal guide, and we have importantly produced uh, an open data license. It's my impression that um, when you want to use data from, from other data sources, it's a great problem if you have one type of license from, from one supplier of data, another type from, from a different supplier of data, because it's really difficult to organize around different um, conditions for use. What we've done is we have made one 
um, open data license for the government. It's not mandatory for, for government to use it, but we really recommend that they do it because it helps users of data understand that you can use this data exactly the same way as using this other type of, of data. It's, it's not as such a Creative Commons um, license, but it's compatible with, um, with the most basic um, Creative Commons uh, licenses that actually the only um, sort of condition that the public sector is allowed to impose is that they want to be credited as the source of the data. For example, which is very important for everybody to know, including the public sector, they're not allowed to tell users not to use their data commercially. I think that if, if one of you approached uh, a public agency, they would probably tell you, well, perhaps we can give you this data, but you can't really use it for business purposes. Yes, you can use it for business purposes. In fact, it's illegal for the public sector body to prevent you from doing that. That is what the PSI legislation does. It says, once you start providing data openly, you cannot um, impose conditions like that. And that's really important. And my job over the next, hopefully just six months, probably one year, is going to be telling everybody about this because this is really counterintuitive in the public sector. For some reason, public sector um, agencies and civil servants think, no, no, I can't be involved in anything that has anything to do with business. I don't know why, but this is really the, the attitude. So it's important for you to know it. Also, I collect success stories because I think if there's one thing that can convince more people, whether they're from the government or from business, to open up their data and to engage in this, to become part of an ecosystem, it is a great success story. It is that illustrative example that really shows you, so that it really hits home, okay, this is what it's all about. And I was reminded about this in the, one of the previous uh, presentations about the problem of talking about APIs. What's really an API? If you can make a kind of value proposition that is as simple as saying, well, cloud computing makes your um, computing much more flexible, much more um, cheap, you should be able to do the same thing here. You should be able to say, this is the reason why you should open up your data. So if you have great success stories of using public sector data, please do send them to me because we really need that. This is the data catalog, the way it looked when we launched it and unfortunately the way it still looks. It's not quite as, um, as out of date as this suggests, luckily, but it's really, it's really bad and it is a bad catch-22 situation. I would like to, uh, to make a completely new one based on on, I don't know if you know it, the um, open source tool CCAN, which is used around the world by many governments. But until I can actually demonstrate demand for it and that public sector bodies are going to use it, I'm not going to be allowed to do that. So how do I demonstrate that? Well, that's why I ask you guys for success stories. The basic data, the really expensive data that are now free of charge, are these types of data sets digital maps from uh, the Danish uh, Geodata Agency, the elevation model, which is basically showing you exactly how flat Denmark is, because <laughs> we don't really have mountains, but if we had, you'd see the mountains, now you just see how flat it is. Um, the cadastral map, who owns which plot of land, um, company information, I think this only covers sort of the very basics, but that's better than nothing, it used to be very expensive. And then the official addresses, actually they were opened up and made free of charge some years ago and um, now they have just been included in this program. The interesting thing is that this program started out internally in the public sector. This was all about making the public sector more efficient because data sharing would be a lot easier because the crazy thing is that public sector bodies used to charge one another for this type of data. So they would actually have to send an invoice and then get the data. And you're probably not surprised to hear that that just led to the situation in which everybody were building their own registries and trying to run them and keep them updated, which they were not. And it was a lot more expensive, a lot more complicated, and it really didn't do anything for innovation. So originally it was thought of as a kind of internal 
um, project that was going to make the public sector a lot more effi efficient. And then along the way, somebody actually sat down and calculated the business case for opening up this data to the private sector as well, and surprise, it was even better. The blue bits are the savings within the public sector, and the orange bits are um, gains in the private sector. And as we have a problem at the moment with sort of decreasing productivity and we need more innovation, um, everybody, even my ministry, realized we need to open up also to the private sector. There are so many obstacles. Even though we did this good thing and we made this expensive data free of charge, we still have so many obstacles. And I think these are the main obstacles and especially probably um, the three uh, highlighted in bluish green. Um, people tend to focus very much on the data itself. That's what I talked about, that data can be either data or it can be some kind of digital raw material for a great business model. And I think another real great problem is that this kind of evolution cannot be controlled by the government. And if there's anything civil servants don't like, it is giving up control. Um, and, and that cannot be changed. This is just the way it is. We have to learn that this is the way it is. And then also, I think, the fact that this opening up data really requires a kind of agile and iterative approach, we're not very good at that. Either we do nothing or we create huge projects. We don't do that thing in between. So that is really a great problem. Um, so this is the kind of thing, if you want to get hold of public sector data and you've, if you want to persuade a new agency to do something, this is the kind of thing you're up against and this is the kind of thing I'm up against. And more specifically, if you ask for data, it's my impression that you're probably going to hear at least one of these. First of all, they're going to say, say what? Open data? Get my data? What, what you're talking about? They simply don't know. And for that, I think the good thing is that um, as a developer, you should be in a position to educate them. Maybe not telling them exactly what data is, but telling them what kind of great things can come out of opening up one's data. Success stories. Then there's the thing that they think it's too costly to open up data. Possibly. I mean, there is no limit to how costly you can make it. And again, it's my impression that we have this kind of love for big projects, or at least that's what we do. So we can easily make it very costly. But opening up data need not be costly, at least not in the first two or three steps. The next one is they simply don't know how to do it. I would think that a lot of developers would be the right people to tell them, well, you can do it in certain ways, it can be very simple, it can be more complicated. And this is also what, what we try to help them do. We, we have this technical guideline, how can you actually open up data? And just to let you know, usually we don't tell people to build APIs, at least not <coughs> as the first or second step. We tell people to publish whatever data they have, just chuck it on the internet for people to see it, and then if a lot of people seem to be really interested in getting data, then you can think about building an API so they can actually access this data directly. Even if they can't do that, just write a description of the data you have and include your intention to try and open up the data if somebody wants it. The next one is worry. What if somebody takes our data and finds out that there's an error in it? To which I say, I bet there's going to be an error in it because nobody's perfect. But that is a real problem in the public sector. We are very afraid to show that we are not completely and utterly perfect. And to be fair, I think um, a lot of people, especially probably citizens like myself, are very quick to point fingers and say, <laughs> you're not perfect, that's not good enough. But this is just an anxiety that you, you need to find a way to work around. The next thing is that um, civil servants may say, well, I don't think people are going to understand our data. I mean, I'm an expert on this data set. I know what it means, but what if other people misunderstand it? And usually I say, yeah, that could probably happen. Um, but luckily, if, if you slab on the open data license that we have produced, there's actually a disclaimer in it that says, if you take this data and you do something with it and your life goes to hell, it's not our problem. So I think this, this is um, 
uh, too much an anxiety, but I think it's on only fair enough to, to remember that they are also genuinely concerned. They don't want people to get in trouble by simply misunderstanding data. The next one is that people are not being asked or paid or rewarded for doing this because opening up data is not really an official job, at least not in most uh, public agencies. So you need to realize that if people say, well, I don't really know how to do it, but I'll see what I can do, I'll try to help you, they're probably going outside what they're normally doing and they're probably trying to find extra time to do it for you. So just understand that this is, this is how it works. And then the last one I think is the best one because that's really fair. They might ask, okay, if I do that, what's in it for me? And that's the really clever one because that's at least that's an opening because then you can start explaining to them what's in it for them. And some of the things that are in it for them are these. these this is a sort of combination of what you can gain and, and the kind of things that are sort of helping you um, understand why you should open up data. For example, help public agencies achieve their own policy goals. Um, I think it was uh, Ben who said, um, well, if, if you start to make something available, people start to get very creative and they do things that you didn't even imagine, but in the end it can actually come back and it can help you. And I think this is really important that maybe if you want to, to get data from a public agency, try to think, okay, what is this agency all about? How can I try to put this in terms that they will understand and they will realize that in the end they need to open up this data? Not for me, but for their own sake. Things like getting other people to create cool apps on top of data. So as a public agency, you don't need to do it yourself. You don't need to do all kinds of creative things, but you don't really get in, in the way of other people who want to do it. Also, you might actually stumble, as a public agency, upon the occasional, what I call, free lunch, that somebody actually creates some kind of service or helps you in some way that you didn't even know you wanted. For example, I have this example that when the Danish addresses were opened up, the OpenStreetMap community in Denmark took all these addresses and checked them against their database, and then they wrote back to the agency pointing out every single place where they found a discrepancy between the two. And in some cases, there was a great reason for the discrepancy, and it wasn't really changed. In other cases, they said, well, you're right, there's an error. And they didn't freak out because these errors were, were pointed out. They merely corrected the data. And now they have a better address um, data set. And I think if you want to get hold of public sector data, you really need to think like this. You could call it being a bit manipulative. Think what's in it for the public sector itself. How can I avoid triggering all their concerns and anxieties and how can I actually get them to be a bit excited about, th about this? What I say to the public sector agencies, and now I'm getting to the thing about maybe no APIs, is that first of all, they should do something simple. They should not make a huge API building exercise up front if they don't even know what this data is going to be used for. Of course, if they realize that they need the data themselves, and they need to get it through an API, for example, for another department to have easy access. Perfect, fine, that's a good reason to make an API. But don't start there unless you know that this is what you need. You have to calculate the risk and the value, and you have to stay in that extra sweet spot. Of course, you can, you can think big. Okay, we want to do this because we want to revolutionize Denmark and the uh, public sector. But you should definitely start by doing something small or smallish, and then you should do it now. And actually, I should add, and whatever you do, don't panic. <laughs> Even if you have to do something like this, it's okay. I mean, this may not be the obvious way of, of flying, but if it works, you can start that way, and that goes for the public sector. You can start in a very simple um, sort of um, doing things on a shoestring type of way, and it also goes for the people who want to get access to data. Don't aim for perfect when you first approach a public sector body, because they're just going to tell you no. But maybe show them 
something like this, show them some kind of prototype. This is what I could do if I could get hold of this data. Then in the end, what's going to happen? Um, like I said, as, as we're speaking now, um, a new Danish PSI Act is actually being passed by Parliament. It's been through the first time, and it's likely that it's going to go through within a month or something. Um, and I think this is a great opportunity to start really explaining to public sector agencies that this is important. It's important enough that we actually have legislation trying to promote it. There are smart cities, in smart city initiatives going on in lots of, of Danish cities and municipalities, and they want people to create cool stuff to develop the cities. And I think this is a really great way to start because the municipality wants it, the developers want to do something. That could be a match made in heaven, and that could actually produce some success stories for me. Then I was thinking, as this is a part of a Nordic tour, how about we create some kind of Nordic hackathon? How about working together? Because the Nordic countries are pretty similar, so we have uh, pretty similar uh, governments, and also we understand each other's languages, so we can actually use each other's data. And this is something I'm um, not secretly, but sort of secretly working on. And I hope that uh, whether you represent companies or you're just individuals interested in this, that you would want to join and be part of it. And then, of course, I hope to, uh, to be able to build myself a new data, data catalogue. Most of all, I hope you'll get back to me if you have ideas or questions or um, tips um, of things that I should look into, things I should read, people I should talk to, um, because this is really the kind of thing that we have to build together. Thank you very much.